Hey everyone, thank you so much for tuning in to episode six of the Zach Kuhn Show. I cannot wait for you guys to hear this interview with Steve Schnur. Steve is the worldwide executive of music for electronic arts. So what does that mean? Well, if you've ever played a video game in the EA world, that's Sims, that's FIFA, that's Madden, that's NHL, that's Star Wars, there's so many others. Steve and his team picked every single piece of music that you hear in that game. So that's everything from playlist curation to having artists record covers in Simlish to hiring composers. His team travels all over the world seeking out the best talent and I just don't know how they do it. To me, it seems so overwhelming. I it, it blows my mind, but we talk all about it. We talk about the process. We talk about the future of the music industry, of the gaming industry, how the two are going to collide. So much interesting goodness in this. We talk about the beginning of his career as well. Can't wait for you guys to dive in. There's so much to listen to. I'm going to stop talking. Let's just get into it. Steve, we are recording on the podcast. Thanks for being here. Thank you. So I'm so excited to talk with you right now because of the time we're in where video game consumption is so high, content is exploding through the roof, and, you know, video games are just capturing the imaginations and filling people's time, and, you know, I think they're being involved in people's lives in a completely different way than we've ever seen before. So I'm really curious from your perspective of things, I guess out of the, out of the gate, just a very general question. What have you guys been seeing in terms of the relationship of video games and consumers? Well, uh, the relationship between video games and consumers is very different than the relationship between any other medium. Um, it's a very personal relationship. It's a first person relationship. In other words, you can immerse yourself in, you know, entertainment, but it's completely, you know, focused on you and your own interactivity and your choices. Can't say that about film. You can't even say that about music. Um, I think when you say this time, I assume you're talking about particularly this time of coronavirus. Right, right, right. And um, what's been interesting, and I think we've really stepped it up, frankly, as a as a company is your relationship not just with other players, but your relationship with, you know, your, you know, your, uh, the people that you hold in the highest regard, sports legends and uh, musicians, you know, we've created this incredible virtual interactive relationship with them. I mean, even if you notice that whether it's Nashville SC, the uh, new MLS team, or it's, LAFC, even those teams have been playing virtual tournaments against each other. Um, Look at, you know, what Fortnite did uh, last week. Um, You know, with their virtual in-game concerts. I mean, these are, yeah, I mean, it continues. And these are experiences that, frankly, only video games can have, but there's a credibility in the relationship between the player and the publisher, the game itself. And I think, you know, that it's not just um, something that popped up yesterday. There's a deep integration and a credibility and a relationship between gamer to gamer, gamer to publisher, to uh, to where, you know, there's a trust that if they're going to get involved in an activity that involves FIFA, um, that's just not a random thing. That's just not an experimental thing. The timing of this coronavirus you know, people didn't suddenly go towards video games and experience video games. They've been experiencing and embracing games for quite some time now. So I think this gave everybody an opportunity to dig in even deeper on something they know, love, and trust. You know, I wanted to talk about the Travis Scott concert, actually, because I think what's interesting is, you know, you had that event and – and, you know, 20 million plus people come to it. And I think it kind of makes you question, well, if this digital animated character, obviously based on a real person, but can draw 20 million people to a platform, in the back of my mind, it's almost like, well, do we need real breathing physical stars? Like, what does that, you know, human element bring to it? Maybe you're, you base these characters on people and then you can go and build these personas in the game or anywhere else. 
Like, like, can you picture a future where we're building, you know, these stars online to interact in video games and, you know, the physical presence of celebrities almost, you know, wanes because of that? I mean, does that make any sense? Totally. And, and I think the answer is yes. And I think the answer is we're already there. And we're already on our way. And the only thing that's separating the believable from unbelievable is a generation gap. I think if you ask that same question to, you know, an 18-year-old person, you know, in their college dorm room, they would say, of course, without hesitation. I think anybody that's gone through a transition between, you know, what a superstar used to look like, what a superstar used to have to be, present themselves, certainly that's a matter of sort of not getting it maybe, or not growing or changing. And that goes beyond, you know, a superstar. I'm not saying there won't be movie stars in the future. Of course there will be. And I'm not saying there's not going to be rock stars in the future. Of course there will be. But there's also going to be other kind of stars. I mean, who would have predicted 20 years ago, 15 years ago, the level of popularity of esports? 15 years ago, if you would have told people that uh, people were going to sit there on a platform multiple platforms, but, you know, one specific platform, and watch other people play games. And those other people were going to be superstars, superstars of the equivalent of the quarterback of the Titans. I mean, that level of superstar. Um, probably most people would have said no way. So, right. you know, I think, yes, I think we're going to have virtual superstars. We're going to continue to, Sorry. I think we're going to have continue to have esports stars, and who knows what that is going to lead towards. I think we're going to have virtual artists. I think we're going to have virtual – listen, there's composers. If you see – of course, we all love, and I continue to work with people like Hans Zimmer, superstar in every sense of the way when it comes to comp music compositions. But there's other guys like Gordy Hobbs, you know, who probably our parents don't know who that is. You know, but he composed the music to Battlefront 1, Battlefront 2. He co-composed with Stephen Barton the music to Jedi Fallen Order. Stephen Barton, the composer for Apex. Those are superstars to a next generation. Totally. They are what John Williams was when he composed Star Wars to me. You know, I know I'm going here from Travis Scott to, you know, what I consider to be classically oriented composers. But they're superstars. And, and I think the generation gap of people that are older that still play video games, but they just don't have the ability to look at next generation virtual artists or artists that they discover through games as, as a matter of uh, superstardom. But I think that generation gap is actually a great thing because video games, you know, are something that your parents still shouldn't understand. They still should. Like Will Smith said, you know, parents don't understand. That's important. So I think the Travis Scott thing to 20 million people that saw it, I think it's a no-brainer. And this is not a one-off. I think Fortnite has been very smart. They obviously did their thing with Marshmallow. They did this, where that leads to, I'm not an EA of the mind that we cut and paste and do the same thing. We're not going to all of a sudden have somebody else show up next week in Madden football. But we have to do something innovative, and we have to respect the gamer, and we have to respect the player is everything. And we have to bring entertainment, new entertainment ideas to them through a new platform that is bigger than the film and music industry combined. People don't, still don't understand the impact um, of the game industry. They still think of it as Mario or... Tetris or, you know, Guitar Hero or things like that. It's a massive platform, and it is truly global. I hope that helps to um, answer the question. Well, it's, it, it's obviously a great point, which is that the gaming industry is so big. I personally am incredibly fascinated in the gaming industry and its relationship to music, but I don't find myself playing video games. I don't own a console to me, if I've got a little bit of extra time, I want to pick up a guitar and play uh -huh. some music. I'm personally not gaming, which makes me wonder, and for other people as well, if you are not gaming in today and in the future as the gaming industry continues to blow up, as a fan, as a consumer, 
are you going to start to be left out if you're not already of driving, of discovering new music and driving the artists that are popular? Is that going to be reserved to where maybe once upon a time it was the people who read Rolling Stone and, you know, the scene and whatever that, you know, whatever else? Is the next level of fandom going to be driven in music by video games? Well, first of all, obviously you have no fear of missing out, which is wonderful. I applaud you for that. <laughs> I think it's good. <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting that you said that you would rather pick, pick up guitar, play, write, everything that you do. I think the difference is not our matter. I'm not here to convert you to become a gamer. What I think would naturally be a move for you, and many others have figured this out, is that as you're writing music, whether it is score, orchestral music, or songs to license, that you understand that video games, that games, the platform of gaming, could be one of your biggest platforms to introduce yourself as an artist to. That's the difference. It doesn't matter that you're a gamer or not. That's okay. You're doing a thing, and your thing is really important. But I would hate for somebody like you or others your age to think that you're going to sign a record deal, wait for somebody to get you on the radio, and then hope some radio station in Paducah and another one in Carson City, Nevada, is going to play you, and then you're going to go on tour, and everything's going to end up like, you know, superstar. That takes a long time, and that was the past. I'm not saying it doesn't exist now, but I'm saying being present in video games, musically speaking, it's critically important for an artist to understand. If you can get a song, a track, or end up composing, if that's what you do, in Fortnite or Madden Football or Grand Theft Auto or Call of Duty or Star Wars, you know, Jedi Fallen Order or FIFA, you, have, you are instantaneously being exposed to millions and millions and millions of people who are face in hundreds of millions of hours collectively, and suddenly you have a base. Now, this is, this is proven time and time again. This goes back to 2003, 2004 with King of Leon and Kasabian and others that sort of were heard the first time. That doesn't mean it's the only place they're heard, but what an what a, what a incredibly deep and genuine, incredible way to launch and maintain your career by the way fast forward to this day you know <laughs> same thing so many hip-hop artists and pop artists this is where they launch their careers you know uh, i know you live in nashville i mean i live in nashville i mean jude and the lions a great example you know they had an album out did very well taking on back a ton of streams on spotify that's critically important and then this last album, they had a track in FIFA and a track in NHL. And they'll tell me, like so many other artists tell me, they're getting, you know, they're getting connected to people from all over the world, whether it's from Italy or Brazil or Japan or somewhere in the U.S. Um, for the first time they heard them. And those fans stick around. They've created, and that's a great example of a band, by the way. I love, uh, I, can, I can have them uh, let you know this. I can have them connect with you if you'd like. They'll talk about they were raised on video games. They discovered sure. bands like Avenged Sevenfold and others heard them the first time in video games, and that's the reason why they became musicians and they were inspired to, to, to become a band later on. So I think it's just a next generation, new generation, current generation platform of discovery. Tons of credibility. If you're a composer and you end up composing, you know, the music to Call of Duty or, you know, Sarah Schachner, total amazing uh, next generation composer, good example of somebody that she could pretty much get any film she wanted, I would imagine. But this is where she chooses to be. And, um, you know, I could list you a million of them. So I don't think that there's any fault in you not wanting to be a gamer. I, zero. It's fantastic. You found your thing. But make sure you take a look at how important that platform is and the people that are there constantly and look at it as a potential platform to launch 
your music in? So as a as an artist, or maybe even more importantly, as a team member of the artist, manager, a label head, or a label, you know, A&R, whatever it is, obviously, you know, an EA sports game is the top of the top of the top. I'm sure there's, you know, there is a ton in between in terms of placements and music you can write for video games. How do you think you go about strategizing to have your music placed in video games? What, what like, and, you know, let's say you're, you're, Maybe not totally starting out. You have a little little bit of buzz. It's not you're not such an obvious pick, but you've got ground to stand on where you could be a good choice for a video game placement. How do you go about getting those placements? Yeah, it's, 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 it. it's a lot of digging. It's a great question, and I mean, at EA, I can tell you, I pride myself that hopefully, you know, we already know who you are. If there's already a little buzz going on somewhere, somewhere in the world, uh, I got reached out yesterday from a band from Michigan. Um, smaller band, hard rock, I would call them heavy metal band, reached out to me yesterday and said, hey, we're a band from Detroit and blah, blah, blah. And I said, oh, I know who you are. You know, so we're already following them. We're not a record company following them to see if we'll sign them. We're just following them. We're following a ton of bands. So I, I can't guarantee that every single band on the planet's on our radar. I think a lot are. Um, but that's what we do. Now, you're right. There's a million other games out there. There's a million other developers out there. So how do you get their attention? Because we're, you know, we're specifically very musically focused. And that takes a lot of digging. I think, you know, unfortunately, because of, you know, coronavirus, there isn't going to be an E3 this year or probably a GDC Game Developers Conference. But those are great places to go to, great places to be seen, great places to get to know people. If you dig in and you kind of look at all the developers, the games you like, the smaller developers are pretty accessible. It's not like trying to get a call into the, you know, chairman of Sony Records and trying to see if they'll listen to your song. Calling a smaller developer in Berlin or Edmonton or wherever it is, Raleigh, wherever it is in the world, and they're everywhere, and getting to know the audio guys and getting to know them and saying, hey, I have a song or two, and hopefully it'll fit. If not, we'll sort of... You know, let's see if we can mix it to fit, whatever the case may be. Getting to know what they do, what they're building, that's important. you got to get to know the game before you can pitch the song. You want to make sure it's a good pitch. Um, this is very possible. And at that point, you know, if that song takes off and gets noticed by, let's say it's a smaller game and, you know, a couple hundred thousand people, knock on wood, listen to it. No reason why it can't be licensed again. And then by definitely it has the eyes and ears of Activision and EA and others. You know, it's sort of like the old days when you would try to get, you know, your band played on a local radio station, you know, and then eventually if it took off, chances are somebody in New York or somewhere else, you know, was paying attention to it at that point and saw the reaction. Does that make sense? Totally. So, I mean, these playlists, the Madden playlists, you know, other EA you know, sports playlists, they're so iconic. I was talking to people who played these games, and they have yeah. such emotional attachments to these playlists. Yeah. And the, the interesting thing is that you have to build these playlists in advance because then the game comes out and they, the songs still need to sound current and fresh. So right. you're constantly looking for artists that are, are ahead of the curve. You were saying you know bands everywhere, and I have no doubt that your team does. How do you how do you organize this? How do you structure this? <laughs> how are you guys finding bands? Where do you look under rocks? Uh, first of all, your your question comment made me smile. I mean, um, culturally, I'm very proud that you know we used to say, <laughs> excuse me, that um, we used to want to be a part of culture, and I say this with all the humility uh, you can imagine, but. You know, I truly believe we have become a part of culture. We are culture. The fact that so many people out there can recognize the artists, the songs, the cues that they heard in NHL 07 or Matt in 2011 or whatever, FIFA. I got every year of FIFA. I mean, sorry to go on a tangent, but, you know, before when we used to travel, before this lockdown thing, um, right. I would literally travel to – Europe, somewhere, Germany, UK, and the guy would go to stand my passport and say, you know, what, uh, what do you do? Who do you work for? I'd say music. I run music at EA. And, oh, my God, do you, did you do FIFA 2011? Oh, my God. I mean, he would forget what we were doing. And that didn't happen once. 
That happens all the time, and that makes me smile. Because it really is the genuine reason why we do it. Um, I am very, very proud that we have a – I've had the same team now for 17, 18 years, and we're obsessed about music. We're obsessed about the way we fight with each other, kindly fight, um, over music and what we feel is right for the title and what will move – it's never about us. Believe me, if it were up to me and I put all my favorite songs in there, it would sound very, very different. It's about what we feel will connect to gamers, what they're going to discover and make it theirs. And so, hypothetically, Madden 21 in three years will be as meaningful, musically speaking, as Madden 18 was or as FIFA 2012 was or whatever the case may be. We look at it like that. What is going to not just hold up, but what is going to be discoverable and meaningful and change people's lives? What is going to find its way into other parts of the world? In other words, can that song represent what football sounds like in the future? You know, can that song in FIFA, can that band go and play Italy or Berlin or Brazil and suddenly people show up because FIFA was that meaningful to them? They love the band, but the culture of the game has so much meaning to them that they're looking to continue that connection in any way, shape, or form. So we take it pretty seriously, um, and and yet we have fun doing it. Like I said, we argue a lot over the music, but that's fun. That reminds me, listen, when I was 15, I would argue with music with all my friends. Those were the greatest days on the planet. You know, it's oh, not totally. Arguing. It's not arguing for the sake of arguing. It's arguing because you passionately believe in something, you know. Um, and so I, I've managed to create a well-diversified team when it comes to not just musical taste, genres, but also musical passion. Um, and I think, you know, we're, we're – so I can't tell you that we don't miss things. Hopefully we don't miss many things. Maybe we do. You know, I keep a list. When I find things we miss, I, I, I keep a list and I keep it handy. But you pin uh, it on the wall, on the conference room wall in, in front of everyone reminding them what we missed. <laughs> Well, I, I have been known to say to some people on my team, like, why, what, what was up with this? Now, i got to tell you a story, okay? And I'm yeah, really yeah. Being vulnerable here, okay? Because it's going to make me look stupid, and I'm sorry. <laughs> but to show you how good my team is, right? Because we license thousands of songs a year. I, I'd be lying to you if I, like, oh, yeah, this song. I, could, you know, I can't name every single song we ever license. It's a team effort, and we... You know, find them, license them, and we have to move forward. But about a year ago, give or take, all of a sudden, I was like, wow. All of a sudden, I heard Lizzo somewhere. You know, maybe it was my 15-year-old daughter said, I'm really into Lizzo. And this is, you know, a year ago, maybe three-quarters of a year ago. I wasn't on the radio yet. And I went back to my team. I'm like, why did we miss Lizzo? What is wrong with us? And Savelle Pettis on my team said, you weren't paying attention. She was in The Sims four years ago. And I was like, yes! <laughs> so, yeah, four years ago she was in The Sims. Now, one could say that was too early, but I'd rather be too early than way too late. I never want to be a follower. So just the fact that we were in there, we loved it, and she recognized it, I'll give her all the credit, you know. Oh, man. Um, I'd love so, to hear her simlish. <laughs> yeah, I can get you a copy of it. We have it. She did it. I don't oh remember my the track God. off the top of my head, but, yeah. It's, and that, so, that list is long, you know. Um, so so how do you specifically, I mean, you you pull songs from so many markets. I have a hard enough time keeping up with American music alone, although I pride myself at being able to do so. I mean, you guys are all over. Are you looking at international playlists? Are you talking to labels and, man, like, managers? How do you how do you really dig into it? It, it seems overwhelming. Like, how, how do you guys not get overwhelmed by it? It is overwhelming. It is overwhelming, but we, you know, head down and forward. I mean, this year has been especially challenging because people on my team every single year, you know, are off to Europe and they'll meet with, you know, every manager, every label, every publisher. When I say label, I just don't mean Sony and Warners. I mean every label, every management group will follow up on artists that we felt good about last year but maybe weren't ready yet and this year we haven't been able to physically get there we it's really usually physically going there you know what i mean making sure that um 
uh, you know, you're not just waiting for an email, so to speak. This year's been a little challenging, but that doesn't mean, you know, we're having all those meetings. They're just on Zoom. Um, but, you know, we uh, are everywhere. We do not um, – the only thing that we don't really follow, as you mentioned, are playlists. I figure once something has been playlisted, particularly radio stations, by the way. It's too late. It's way too late. Now, I have tons of friends in radio, and I work with radio stations for years, and I'm friends, you know, to this day with guys that run or ran the K-Rocks and all those great radio stations, but it's way too late. I pride myself that we'll put something in a game and rate the research that radio needs so badly to validate being on the radio will be effective. You know, I had Kevin Weatherly, um, this is years ago, when he was at K-Rock, call me and um, and ask me if we were playing, um, you know, a particular song. And um, I said we were. We had put that in Madden. And I asked him why. And he, um, he said because it's testing 90% familiar on K-Rock and we have never played it. That, to me, is a success story. I don't want to own the band. I don't want the band to not get on the radio. I don't want the band to not go into a competitor video game. I don't want the band to not, you know, become the biggest band on Spotify. I want all of that. I just want to be the first place that you hear it because then it will, we can always equate, it, equate ourselves to being the destination, be it FIFA or Madden or Need for Speed or The Sims. We're the place that you know you're regularly going to come and discover music that's going to change your life. Um, I said that for day for uh, day one, you know, quite a long time ago, and we still mean it to this day. So we look at it as, even though it is overwhelming, it's a responsibility we have. Um, we know that people next year will, will either love or hate what they hear. We're aiming for love, obviously, every time. And, right. um, you know, we take it very seriously that we got we have to dig deep um, we have to spread a very wide net and make some hard decisions. We say no way more than we say yes. We've made mistakes, but hopefully we have gotten it right many more times than we haven't, if that makes sense. How many people are on the team? It's small, man, lean and mean. Um, there are, let's see, I have myself. I have my um Sabel Pettis, who's my uh, head of music supervision. I have Rafaela Lima, who's my head of music marketing. I've got Vina Foss, uh, who is my coordinator specifically towards scores and orchestras. Um, I've got Jonathan Watkins, who um, also from Nashville, by the way, um, head of music uh, publishing and also soundtracks. Um, we're bringing in a new person, finally, who's going to work with us on all of our um, licensing um, production stuff. Um, we've got an amazing head of licensing, uh, Beverly, who's um, based in Vancouver. We've got a lawyer or two, and that's a pretty lean and mean team if you add that up. I didn't do counting just now, but it's pretty lean and mean. You, if you go to a film studio music department where they have you know, much less licensing, m fewer projects, they've got three to four times the staff. Um, I think I learned this years ago from, ironically, Strauss Delnick, who now is the CEO of Take-Two, our competitor. But I worked for him when I was at BMG in Arista. And I was in Nashville uh, running a part of uh, Arista Nashville called Arista Austin. And I would always ask him for more headcount. And he would always say, no, 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 lean a mean, lean a mean. That makes you focus on what's critical, what's important, all that other stuff. I'll have to make some hard decisions. It goes away. And I took that to heart. And I think we focus on exactly what we're speaking about here. Incredibly cultural move-the-needle moments, whether it's discovering music, whether it's ensuring we're with next generation, incredible music compositions, whether it's marketing things we do with musicians that also move the needle on culture. I mean, think about what we turned – the EA Sports Bowl used to be known as the Madden Bowl into over the years. It's an event that happens three days before the Super Bowl every single year. And when, it, when the Super Bowl was in Atlanta recently, it was the best of Atlanta. 
It was ludicrous to T.I., to Migos, and you name it. This year, Miami, past year, best to hip-hop, next generation, the baby, Megan Thee Stallion, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Cultural moments. We're not trying to talk about, from a music marketing perspective, what we used to know about. We're not trying to brag about, well, look at us. You know, Snoop has been an incredible partner, but it's not about looking back. It's about who's the next generation and how are we going to ensure not only are we going to become a part of it, but how are we going to ensure that gamers and players understand that we're a reliable place as to discover what's next. So you mentioned live events in the video game world, and this is sort of something I've been thinking about, which is, you know, obviously all of the live promoters are at a standstill, yeah. and vid the video game world has been building these venues for video game competitions mm -hmm. and live events, and they're not being used 24-7. And I've kind of been thinking – you know, the video game industry could literally treat the live entertainment field almost as a loss leader. Correct. Is there, is there any world where, you know, in 25, 30 years, this is maybe kind of crazy, does the video game world become the music promoters? I think absolutely, considering, you know, I, I would say between virtual and artificial and virtual and augmented reality, I would say absolutely. I would say, you know, the concept of seeing Beyonce or DaBaby or Springsteen or, you know, whoever you want to see in 10 years, 20 years, um, might be in your living room. You know, uh, the next generation, whoever that next generation of musicians are, I'm not saying that people aren't going to go see Springsteen if they can get out of the house in the next five, 10 years, I'll be one of them. Um, but the truth is, whoever that next generation of musicians are, they may not in 10 years have to leave their house. They may virtually come into your house through your gaming platform and perform for, as we just saw with Travis Scott, tens and tens of millions of people. So, yes, I think it's highly possible and, frankly, highly probable. I'm not saying there's going to be a shift and suddenly, you know, game companies as we know it are going to suddenly take the place of Live Nation. But their platforms might take the place of Staples Center or Bridgestone Arena. You know, I don't think that many people in 10 to 20 years are going to venture out and want to go look at what is kind of old school comparatively to an augmented reality experience. You could literally imagine experience Coachella in 5 to 10 years and never leave your house. Now, one could argue, yeah, but we're your friends, you know? It's all about interacting, having a good time. Your friends the are outfits. there, too. Your friends are there, too, you know? Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening, and I hope you're enjoying the show. Some of you may know that I run an industry newsletter called The Nashville Briefing. It really takes you to the front row of everything happening in our industry. And if you want to learn more about it, you can go to nashvillebriefing.com to subscribe. Also, if you're enjoying this show and specifically this episode, please feel free to give us a five-star review on your podcast listening platform. Thanks so much. Now back to the show. Okay, let's go back. So you live in Nashville now, but are, are you from Nashville originally? Not originally. I'm from New York, Jersey, that area there. Um, okay. But I moved to Nashville in 94. And... Um, just a really incredibly special place for very many reasons, but one, because <laughs> excuse me, every music just everything about this town is music. If you literally walk one block in either direction from my house, you have the greatest record producers, incredible artists, incredible writers. You can make the greatest record and walk three doors down and collect everybody in between. Um, this place is not a place as L.A. is, where it's an actor-first mentality. It's not a place like New York, where it's finance-first mentality. This is music. Where, and, and music is not just country here. And I hope people are starting to realize that finally about Nashville. I mean, I, I really felt that 20 years ago. Um, I'm not saying country isn't critically important to Nashville and known for it. But at the end of the day, I bet most people don't realize, for instance, that, that Nashville – 
is one of the top two recording destinations for film, television, and games on the planet. People don't realize when they play Call of Duty, when they play Fortnite, when they play Madden football, they, those scores that you hear were recorded here in Nashville. Now, you know, you've really been driving that effort. Why, why is that important to you? Why, is this, why do you feel this is the, the best place to be recording scores? Well, I think it's this and London, and, and I think we really have become one of the top two. I think that the musicianship here, you being one of them, so I've learned, um, is best in class, best in the world. If you are a great classical musician and you go to Juilliard or, you know, or Berkeley or wherever you end up studying, you really have a few places you know you're going to go to to make a living. Um, they're in New York. They're Los Angeles. They are Nashville. Um, they are London, if you can get a green card to work there. Um, and so you have a group, a collection of some of the greatest musicians on the planet here. Some of the greatest cellists and brass players live here. Um, and it really was a matter of educating people in the industry. That's just not games. That's also film and television. It was educating them um, that this exists here. We have a great studio at Ocean Way on Music Row. We are in process of building the biggest scoring stage on the planet here in Nashville. It will be bigger than Abbey Road and certainly be as state-of-the-art. Um, and that's going to be a second stage in town. And again, I keep coming to this. This isn't just Call of Duty, Fortnite, and, and others. This is, you know, Lost in Space, which is on Netflix. Uh, this is Fargo. Uh, which I believe was on AMC. Don't hold me to that. Sorry if I'm wrong. It was Harriet, which was which got nominated for an Academy Award this year um, in the uh, composer category, and so on and so on. All recorded here. Um, this has been building for about the last five, six, seven years. And the reason why I feel it's important is because I believe I've seen time and time again we need a high quality global solution to ensure that the best scores possible played by the best musicians possible, you know, are available to every developer, whether it's the size of EA and Activision or, or whether it's small developers. And I believe this is the place, you know, this is the place where this happens to be building. That doesn't mean I don't go to London. London, we recorded Jedi Fallen Order 1 and uh, incredible success. Um, but so many other projects are recorded here. Okay, this new stage that's being built, that's bigger than Abbey Road, this is news to me. Talk a little bit more about that. I mean, that's, that's going to be massive, right? It's massive. It's scheduled now. The schematics are at 4,800 square foot stage. I believe Abbey Road is about 4,300, give or take. It's not a matter of mine is bigger than yours. It's really just a of matter not. of, you know, <laughs> you know, it's really just a matter of, because it's funny because we're building a bridge. My friends who run Abbey Road heard about it. And they came to me in February and said, jokingly, you know, you're not going to put us out of business, are you? And we laughed about it because they know we've been building a bridge between these two cities for quite some time. They know what Nashville is about. We know what they're about. So we're going to – the bottom line is that <clears throat> we've been limited here in Nashville to one studio where I can put about 70, 71, 72 people on the stage. And then even at that point, I'm worried about my cellist arm bouncing the guy next to them. Uh, sure. The state will mean we can record like we recorded Abbey Road Studio One. I can put 110 musicians on the stage, and there will be plenty of room to have a basketball tournament if you want, jokingly. I mean, ultimately, you could probably put about 180, 190 musicians on a 4,800-square-foot stage. So we need that flexibility. It will also have uh, the ability to be recorded. There will be lighting rigs and, lighting rigs and recording rigs and everything imaginable. Um, to make sure it's state-of-the-art. We'll have post-video, post-audio production facilities. I can't tell you yet who's building it, um, uh, where it's going to be, but it is in Nashville, and it is um, a superstar partner who saw the reality of what needed to be done here, who saw the reality of what has been built here, and understood that the only thing stopping us um, uh, from absolutely becoming the world-class uh, destination for film, television, and game recording uh, was the size of the stage. We need this stage. Now, 
you know, coronavirus has gotten a little bit in the way. I don't know if we're going to get our groundbreaking uh, going as quickly as we thought, but the truth is we should be up and running in the next year, year and a half, year and a half, probably more realistic. Okay. So going back, first of all, that's so exciting. And I can't, I can't wait to learn more about, about it. I'm sure it's going to be incredible. It um, will but, be. Going, but going back, so you, you joined EA in 2001 before that you have a long history of working in the label system. How, how do you get the job at EA? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I think it was a perfect storm of a few things in my life. Number one, it was complete frustration as an A&R guy who would pour his heart and soul into discovering a band, making a record, and one radio guy somewhere would decide that they didn't like it, and then the game was over. So, and you were really successful. You were a really successful A&R guy. You weren't like just another A&R guy. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, but the truth is I had as much passion for artists like, you know, Metallica and Sarah McLaughlin, as I did for bands like, I don't know, you know, Aubrey Moore and Dexter Freebish, bands that didn't necessarily go all the way to that level. But I thought their records, I mean, go back and listen to Aubrey Moore's record from the late 90s when she was an heiress to Austin. It's an unbelievable record. And listen to Dexter Freebish, which was on Capitol, I think, in 99, 2000. Amazing record. You know, now, I'm not promising you that, you know, they would have become the next, you know, Rage Against the Machine or whatever the case may be, but we were blocked from the very beginning. And that really used to upset me. We didn't have a chance. We didn't have a shot to get to that next level. And I got frustrated. So I think that was a part of the perfect storm. The other part of the perfect storm was I got a call randomly, oddly enough, from Sandra Bullock. Yes, I actually was at my desk at Capitol Records. I had just left Nashville, uh, Nashville where I ran a label called Heiress to Austin, and the phone rang, and they said it was Sandra Bullock on the phone, and I figured it was just a friend of mine messing with me. And um, I picked up the phone expecting to hear some guy going, yo, man, what's going on? And it really was Sandra Bullock. And I'm like, and I went into full on, you know, probable fl flirtation mode. What did I know? And um, she was completely familiar with every band that I signed when I was at Arista Austin, um, which was Aubrey Moore and others, and was doing a film and wanted to and and, and wanted to see if she could get my take on the music in the film. And I got to know her. It was an incredible. Um, uh, relationship that I have with her musically speaking and I ended up doing Miss Congeniality for her which ended up being a big hit film still is held in the highest regard for many people to this day we just laughed our way through that in the most fun ways you can imagine it was so much fun to do that and so suddenly I had this background of this visual music supervisor uh, element and this A&R person um, and previous to that a marketing person and I got a call ironically from Sarah McLaughlin's manager Terry McBride um, who was friends with the then president of studios at EA um, saying they wanted to talk about starting a a music division much like a film studio, studio I imagine had a music division and wanted to talk to me about it I had never played a video game in my life other than probably picking up Wave Runner on Nintendo 64 just because I wanted to impress a band that I was trying to sign in the 90s, and that's what they did. You know what I mean? So otherwise, I was a music snob, um, but I went up to Vancouver to visit them, and my mind was blown. I couldn't believe it. It was like MTV in the 80s. It was like the place was on fire. There was 1,000, 2,000 people all around these massive buildings playing games, creative, talking, playing things loud. It was incredible. It was like what a record company should have been. Are you okay, I, I, I really want to talk all about that, and, and we're going to dive into it. Really quickly, though, the big sync that sticks out in my mind for Miss, Miss Congeniality is when she walks out of the airplane hangar and, <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and Mustang Sally is playing. Who, who put that song in? How, how did that song get in the movie? Well, it's, a, it's a fun story. It's gotten interpreted and reinterpreted over the years. We talked about a million uh, cues for that. Um, the editor, Billy, um, we walked in one day, and he had taken, um, I want to say, 
this was the the version from the um, film. Oh my God, what was the name of the film? The uh, I can't believe I'm blanking on the film. It'll come to me in a second. Um, but um, I'm looking it up now because it's going to drive me nuts. But he had um, put it in. And at first I went, eh, it's kind of cheesy, I'm not sure. But it worked. So then we decided that we were going to um, cut it and um, cut it in. And we were going to cut the track ourselves. So what we got, Los Lobos, who, listen, it takes place in San Antonio. We wanted a Hispanic element to it. And we got, and it was 2000, in year 2000, right? So um, give or take. So it was, they were pretty happening then. Uh, oh, by the way, the film was The Commitments. Sorry about that. Okay. It was the band yep. Commitments. And um, we cut it. We had a lot of fun. I remember um, Sandra Bullock played tambourine on it. And I have somewhere uh, in my pile, uh, this is pre-iPhone, right? So somewhere I have on one of those li- little mini tapes, um, I have her playing tambourine with the Los Lobos. Um, <laughs> I'll find that wow. someday in that pile, that big box of tapes that I have. Um, but we put it in. But that didn't work. You know, it worked as the end title, which it is. We ended up putting the original version of the commitments into that scene, the one we started with, and then ended up using the Los Lobos version as an end title. Oh, um, wow. But yeah, that was, that was a moment, right? I would have bet zero that that would have stuck in the film because, I don't know, it just seemed like taking a track from another movie and putting it in, that seemed a little odd. You know, and I, but listen, once I saw her play tambourine with Los Lobos, I figured there was no turning back. It was full on production at that point. (laughs) Okay, so we're back at EA, and I remember, I mean, I remember playing video games 2001, 2002 era. I'm on my Game Boy Color, my Game Boy DS, and the music is very like beep boop beep beep. Like, it's very, it's not very thrilling. I mean, it's very. It's very minimal. How how were you, I mean, what was music like at game in games when you joined EA and and like and what were you trying to bring to it? Yeah, I mean, when, when it's nostalgic at least what you're describing, right? It's um, when I started, I found that the music, the sorry, the gaming industry was talking about how much bigger they were than the film industry. But what they didn't acknowledge was that they sounded like the toy industry. And when I sort of took a look under the hood, I realized that they were handling music for the most part. There were exceptions. You know, in a very sort of secondary, haphazard way. In other words, you know, they'd complete a project or get close to completion. They'd realize they really hadn't looked at music yet. And they'd be like, wait a second, um, John, the uh, the engineer, he plays, you know, he's got a synthesizer. Let's see if he can pull something together. It was always employees, and it was, there was no music employees. And when there was, it was a rare exception. You know, it really, they were trying to develop sort of like this sound of what a game should sound like, and yet they were talking about the film industry in pride, you know, that they were bigger than them, but they sounded sort of comparatively silly. Again, I'm not going to knock the nostalgia of those things in hindsight, but um, I really came in wanting to sound like the film industry and more. I wanted to take, you know, the greatest musicians, the greatest next generation composers on the planet and introduce them to the concept of not being tethered to picture, to be able to write and understand that the various pieces, the stems of their material would connect to other stems And the result, the musical result, would always come from the action of the person on the couch. There was no first person on the screen. They weren't writing to see what this actor, you know, against what this actor did. And therefore, they needed to discover his or her musical expression. They were actually writing on various scenarios, infinite scenarios at times. And so it untethered the restrictions, musically speaking, of, song, of writers, of, of, of musicians, of composers. It was a far cry from where it started, you're right, with synthesized, MIDI, you know, sort of 
ditties. Um, they were very proud also, the industry, that they would occasionally license something. They would occasionally license some big artist song, and everybody would be like, oh, my God, I can't believe we did that. I can't believe we did that. How great. But I don't think they ever thought of it as a collection of songs. And they never thought of it as a collection of songs when it came to licensing songs that were meaningful, that their audience would really care and lean towards the songs that were in there. So I think, you know, it, it was sort of in its infancy, so to speak, musically speaking, at the very least. And I think what we did was we didn't grow it up because I never want to grow up, but we basically took it the next step, you know, by a mile as to what the possibilities were. Um, we don't, use employees now to write music in our games. Uh, maybe smaller developers do, but we don't. You know, we hire best in class around the world. Um, you know from this conversation we license, you know, songs that will matter to gamers. Um, we believe that the score to Battlefield to somebody could be what the score to Star Wars was for me when I was a kid. It's meaningful, and it's not an afterthought. How many games do you do you typically juggle out one time? You mean in my, my, oh, my slate, the slates I worked on? I worked right. on. Right. Um, wow. Uh, in terms of scores or overall? In scores, I would say. In terms of music, uh, you know, production overall, so score, play, playlist, curation, whatever it is, how many games are you constantly juggling? Probably work on about 12 to 15 right now. You know, um, Sometimes it's three. Sometimes it's, you know, more than I mentioned. This is that time of year where we're busy as can be to, to make, you know, to get, uh, to finalize all the fall releases. So you've got, you know, I'm working on Madden. I'm working on FIFA. I'm working on NHL. We worked on UFC. We're working on, you know, a bunch that I can't mention yet. You know, always various titles that come out. Sometimes I'm two, three years ahead. I'm already working on, um, titles, um, franchises that will come out in 2021 and 2022. I'm working on things that even go out further than that, but we're sort of trying to define and refine the tone of what that 2023 release may or may not sound like. But I'd say when it comes to active, active soundtracks, be it score or be it license, probably 12 to 15 right now, that's about its height. That's about as much as it gets. Okay, here's a throwaway question, but I have to ask. Give us some insight into working with Hans Zimmer. <laughs> insight? I'll give you all the insight you want because I've got nothing but amazing things to say about him. This is a guy who's probably and easily the most famous composer on planet Earth. Um, and I have to be honest with you, this is a true collaborator. The definition of a collaborator, the definition of a composer. Ego aside, collaboration comes first. Listens wants to discover who the character or characters are, doesn't care if he spends a week, a month, or three months getting it right, takes feedback like no other, um, is an experimental genius, comes up with ideas that are off the chart, um, comes up with things and ideas, you know, musically speaking, also sound design ideas, um, instrumentation ideas, it's really a combination. He's really a combination of a musical genius and a mad scientist all in one. But the difference between him and working with other rock stars are that he doesn't come with the backstage only green Eminem rock star mentality. This is a guy from day one rolls up his sleeves and says, "Let's do it. What do you think?" And when he hands something in, you don't like it. You have the ability to say, "Not feeling that," and he'll be like, "Okay, let's throw it out. Let's do something else." Um, that's one of a kind. Unbelievable. Okay, well, I need it. I mean, I've worked with him many times now, and I'm working with him right now. It's never changed, ever. So cool. Okay, well, we covered so much here. There's so much that we didn't cover. I mean, you're also a songwriter with Seagale Publishing here in Nashville. And, you know, I encourage everyone to go back and, and read Steve's history because there's so much amazing stuff happening where you were at MTV at the early days, you know, yeah. so much time spent at labels. Um, I feel like we could have done five or six of these and still had stuff to talk about. Um, but, you know, lastly, like we mentioned, there's so much that you've done and that, you know, can, you continue to do. Is there anything else in this space, music, video game, anything else that you've always wanted to tap into or 
is there anything else that you hope you get the chance to accomplish in this world? Well, yeah, and I appreciate you asking that. Listen, I think fortunately we're being forced towards that. We mentioned earlier about a virtual environment and where games and game platforms go in the future. I think more people now are comfortable with it. They don't look at it as a toy that their kids play with. Play with. They look at it as a true, unique, massive platform. I think all of the leagues, sports leagues, I think all of the big franchises out there, Star Wars, et cetera, have all finally realized that games are not an afterthought. It's not a toy you put out. Years ago when I started, you'd have some big film, and they'd want a game too. It just was, you know, you want a T-shirt, you want to, you know, be a part of the McDonald's Happy Meal, and, oh, you want a game. That's gone. People realize this is mass entertainment, the biggest, scale, biggest imaginable scale possible. I think what I'd like to do is see all these lines blurred. You know, I imagine you going into a virtual, virtual cloud-like environment where you're getting together with like-minded people, soccer, I mean, soccer, you know, football meaning soccer, you know, fanatics. I'd love to be able to get into a room, a virtual room with other Liverpool fans or, you know, LAFC fans or whatever the case may be. Get into a room with them, play FIFA, watch a Liverpool match, talk about this, share a virtual hot dog. I'm a vegan, so that wouldn't happen. But still, the point is, I'd like to see these lines blurred. You know, maybe even watch, you know, Sunderland on Netflix in the same environment together community. And I think that's what interactive entertainment brings us. It's community. You know, it's virtual community, but it truly still is community. You don't have to leave your house. That's kind of familiar right now, considering what we're all going through, right? But you can literally live and amongst other like-minded people and communities in the world. Um, so I'd like to see us continue to bridge that gap. I think cloud gaming is going to give us enormous opportunities. No more downloads, you know, no more discs. Um, no more lag time, and how does it not just become a gaming-only platform? And so, you know, I, and I think that's going to bridge the gap between music, music streaming, sports, gaming, obviously, you know, and other forms of entertainment, all within, you know, your Xbox, your PlayStation, whatever the case may be. So um, I see it happening. I'm pretty confident it will happen. I think the way we evolve, the evolution you know, of gaming is fast, really fast. So I'm not, I don't think I'm dreaming 10 years down the line. I think I'm dreaming two years down the line. Um, so, you know, we'll see where it goes. Now, if you want to follow the gaming industry, if you want to keep up with it, if you go, holy crap, I want to work in the gaming industry, maybe you're past the traditional age of doing an internship, whatever it is. Are there resources you follow? Are there things you look at every day? How does someone start to immerse themselves into this world? Well, I think if you are in school, by the way, as opposed to 10, 20 years ago, there's incredible opportunities at the collegiate level right now uh, when it comes to, you know, interactive scoring or game development, whatever the case may be. So I think those opportunities are, are uniquely there. Um, I think you need to study it by, first of all, playing. I think you need to immerse yourself in the activity of gaming. I think you need to study and watch and attend when we come, when we're allowed to, you know, esports events. Um, and I think there's amazing um, gatherings out there. Again, we're restricted to them now, but in the future, Game Developers Conference E3, you know, every June, not this June, but every June. Um, there's so many opportunities to go out there. I remember I used to take people to E3 every June, um, people usually in the music industry, and they'd walk in the L.A. Convention Center, which is the size of multiple football fields, um, multiple stadiums, I should say, and literally their mouths would drop to the floor. They couldn't believe how big it was. And I think once you feel that and experience it, all bets are off. Well, Steve, thank you so much for taking the time. I, I can't even imagine – how crazy your schedule is with everything you do on your plate. So thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, I appreciate you, man. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. And it's always good to talk to a fellow New York Jersey guy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Stay safe, stay healthy out there. And I right, hope right. to meet in person when, whenever we can. I'd love that. <laughs> Take care. Be safe. Talk soon. Bye. Bye-bye. Oh, man. Steve, thank you so much for taking the time. It was such a thrill talking. Hope you guys enjoyed listening. The Zach Kuhn Show is mixed by Sam Heyman, and our theme music is by Justin Johnson. Next week, tune into our episode with RJ Curtis, the head of CRS and the radio broadcasters. 
Can't wait for you guys to hear this episode. There's so much history in here about radio, about music. We talk about the future of radio, where it's going to go, and we talk about what it takes to pull off CRS. We get into the dirty details of the conference. Can't wait for you guys to hear it. It's, it's a great, great interview. So much good information. Pumped for it to come out next week. Lastly, if you want to keep up with us, if you can't wait for next week and our interview with RJ Curtis, then you can follow us on socials, everything at Nashville Briefing, and you can subscribe to our newsletter at NashvilleBriefing.com. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next week. Bye.